السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم All praise is due to Allah We praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one And whomsoever Allah leads us away None can show him guidance May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Dear viewers, welcome to another edition of our program Guardians of the Pious and today's episode is number 472 in the series of Explaining Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. Today, insha'Allah, we'll begin with uh, hadith number 1191. That is actually the second episode in chapter number 214, which deals with Fadlu Qiyami Laylat al-Qadri wa Bayanu Arja Layaliha. The, the virtues of praying on the grand night and explaining which night could it be uh, and when to anticipate it. So in the previous episode, after we spoke about the excellence and the virtues of worshiping Allah on the grand night or Laylatul Qadr, we said that many companions have seen in their dreams that it is in the last seven nights of Ramadan and the Prophet ﷺ, since you guys have seen it so, then you should seek it in the last or in the remaining seven nights of Ramadan. In today's hadith, hadith number 1191, which is narrated by the mother of the believers, Aisha radiyallahu anha, قالت, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يجاور في العشر الأواخر من رمضان ويقول تحروا ليلة القدر في العشر الأواخر من رمضان متفق عليه So in this hadith our mother may Allah be pleased with her Aisha the daughter of Abu Bakr the prophet's wife narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him used to seclude himself in i'tikaf during the last ten nights of Ramadan. And he would say, search for the grand night for Laylatul Qadr in the last ten nights of Ramadan. And the Prophet وسلم, while dealing with us, with his companions, he knows that the generations to come will not be as keen and as active in worship as his companion, so he's making things a lot easier for us. Otherwise, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and most of his companions used to pray at night throughout the year. And Aisha once talked to him and said that, why do you burden yourself so much? You're already going to heaven. He said, I'm doing that in order to be a grateful servant to Allah. أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا shakura." So the matter of worshiping Allah and praying night prayer or tahajjud was the norms for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And many of the companions used to compete with him in this regard to the point that he would um, stop them, slow them down, such as Abu Darda, such as Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, such as many companions, the three companions uh, who made the vows, they even wanted to compete with the Prophet ﷺ. He used to rest during the night, then got up to pray, then rest again briefly before Fajr. But those companions wanted to keep up all night, every night, every night. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade that. He said, pray for one third of the night if you want and then rest. Or rest and pray one third of the night and then rest in the remaining one sixth of the night then get up for Fajr. Or the best 
is to pray in the remaining one third of the night waktu sahar but not to stay up all night on every single night you know so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to observe i'tikaf first in, uh, in 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 the middle 10 days of ramadan and in the entire remaining 20 days and nights of ramadan all of that because he was seeking laylat al-qadr because in i'tikaf you don't leave the masjid that's the meaning of yujawiru fil ashr al awakhir in the last year the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam decided to spend i'tikaf only in the last 10 days and nights of ramadan and in i'tikaf all what you do is pray recite quran make dua you want to go out to use the bathroom answer the call of nature take a shower and come back but you don't visit the sick you don't go for a funeral you're in i'tikaf and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ When um, 87 Surah Al-Baqarah So going home, seeing your wife, you're not allowed to approach her or lie down with her or embrace her. Why? Because you are in a state of i'tikaf, seclusion. You can go out whenever it's necessary. Grab a meal, a bite, answer the call of nature and come back. Why? Because he devoted this whole time, day and night for ibadah. Why? He's looking for Laylat al-Qadr, the night which is known as the grand night, the greatest night of the entire year. If you observe it while worshiping Allah, you will be the luckiest. You add to your lifespan another entire lifespan. So the worship of this night is superior in world to the worship of 83 years and 4 months. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Taharraw Laylat Al Qadri Fil Ashr Al Awakhir Min Ramadan. You all should seek Laylat Al Qadr. It will be one of the remaining 10 nights of Ramadan. We know from other hadith that the Prophet وسلم, knew what night was it. But as he came out in order to share with the companions the exact night of Laylat al-Qadr, there were two companions who were quarreling, having dispute. So the Prophet وسلم, got distracted and he was made to forget it. Subhanallah. And maybe this is even for the better of the entire Ummah. Because I can assure you that most of people, if they knew that Laylat al-Qadr is for certain on the 27th or in the 29th night of Ramadan or on the 23rd, I can assure you right now that most of people would not even pray Taraweeh throughout the whole month of Ramadan. They would just come to pray on that night and say, Alhamdulillah, I've given a worship of 83 years and four months, that's it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concealed it, but he made the scope to focus on the last 10 nights of Ramadan. This is what we understand from uh, this hadith. Then, in the following hadith, 1192, also narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. Anna Rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal, تحروا ليلة القدر في الوتر من العشر الأواخر من رمضان. The hadith is collected by Imam Bukhari. Our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, reported that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, used to observe i'tikaf. In the last ten days and nights of Ramadan, and he said you should seek the grand night in the odd nights out of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Oh, okay, so now we even limited and narrowed the scope further. In the previous hadith, we said 10 nights, one third of the month. And the night comes before the day. So if I want to, uh, if I, if I want to observe Qiyam or the night prayer, on the night of the 21st of Ramadan, then today was the 20th of Ramadan at sunset, 
begins the night of the 21st. This is when we start praying. The evening of the 20th of Ramadan. And the Prophet وسلم, in this hadith said, you should seek it in the odd nights. The odd means one, three, five, seven, nine of the last 10 nights. So it is the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, and the 29th. Okay, great. MashaAllah. So that means it's limited to only five nights. And that is confirmed. It is for certain on the remaining last 10 nights of Ramadan and the odd nights of the 10 nights. So it's only five nights. That is not much. This is to encourage those who are kind of less active in worship at least to come on those odd nights. And what happens when you come on any night? I've seen a lot of people who've come for the first time and they loved it. They come because it's Laylatul Qadr. I've done a lot of sins or they come because it's Laylatul Qadr. The dua will be answered. I'm having exams. I'd like to have a child. I'd like to get married. I'd like to get promoted. So let me make dua on that blessed night. Maybe my dua will be accepted. No problem. Come for whatever reason. These are all good causes. So when they come and they witness, especially if the Imam, Allah bless them with a melodious voice and he starts reciting properly, it's like a magnet. It attracts people. It attracts non-Muslims. What about those who are already Muslims, but they were, you know, away from the Quran, away from the night prayer. So they love it. A mission will be accomplished. The mission wants to bring you close to Allah. So when you take the initiative and you walk one step towards Allah, Allah walks towards, towards you several steps, a mile distance. You come towards Allah walking, He comes towards you running and jogging. You just take the initiative and you taste the sweetness of Iman. Five nights? Yes, five nights. So after we tell them that, you know, tomorrow is going to be the first night of the last odd nights of Ramadan, the 21st. They come. Okay? They were not coming since the beginning of Ramadan. Now they come. And you tell them, well, I see you day after tomorrow. But they come tomorrow again. Why? Because now they tasted the sweetness of this prayer, of staying in a masjid. It's, you know, you're showered with blessings. So they come on the 22nd, the 23rd, 24th, 25th, and they say, I wish I have known that from the beginning of Ramadan. So this extra attraction, extra bonus that, that the Prophet ﷺ puts in certain acts of worship, of course, by the leave of Allah, and also limiting that to certain honorable times, honorable places, in order to attract people who are kind of lazy, are kind of being distracted by the dunya, by the worldly temptations, al hakum al takathur. So when they taste arafta falzam, now we recognize it, stick to it, adhere to it. Try to maintain this even after Ramadan. And it does work. It does work with many people. Yani, I just want to share with you. I was studying in Al-Azhar at the age of 12. I've already studied I'tikaf in the fiqh. I was studying the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa. I chose, now I wouldn't say I chose, it wasn't me. My grandpa is the one who said, you know, I want you to register in the Hanafi fiqh. In Al-Azhar you get to study the different branches of fiqh. The Shafi'i, the Maliki, the Hanafi, or the fiqh of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So I said, okay. I asked him, what is the difference? He said, just choose Hanafi. So I signed up for the Hanafi fiqh. And there we studied Itikaf. And then one day I was going to attend, a, uh, you know, um, there was an empty lot where we used to play soccer in that field. We went once to play over the weekend. And unfortunately, it wasn't available anymore because they were building a mosque, a masjid. Uh, of course, we were not too happy because mm. now the property uh, would occupy the place. I will not get to play soccer anymore. 
But after the masjid was erected, I said, let me pay a visit to it. Because I just wanted to remember where we used to play soccer and so on. So when I went there, I saw some youth and their sheikh and they were in i'tikaf. And they were making i'tikaf 20 days and 20 nights. So I went home and I said to my dad, uh, I want to go for i'tikaf. He saw me wrapping my blanket and the pillow and he said, what are you up to? I said, I'm going for i'tikaf. He said, do you know what i'tikaf is first? I said, yes, I studied that in fiqh. He said, this is not a joke. That means you will stay there for the 20 days. You will not come home. You will not leave the masjid. I said, yes, I'm ready for it. And it was like a turning point in my life. In the beginning, I was studying because I have to go to school and I have to study. Now it made a huge difference for me. Whatever I'm studying, I'm learning to practice practically through I have some senior, mashallah, brothers and shiuch, uh, elder uh, youth, but they are elder than me, mashallah. So they walked us through, they taught us a lot of things. So they, we started loving the practice, loving the deen. Now, I studied tajweed already. I, you know, you memorize the Quran, but you are not into really enjoying the recitation of the Quran because it was a homework. You had to do it. But now you're the one who's doing it willingly. They say there is a competition for the Quran in this masjid. You run. You attend here and there. Now your parents are not directing you anymore. They're not asking you stop watching TV because you're not watching TV anymore. You have priorities. 20 days in i'tikaf. And whenever it was announced tomorrow is Eid, I was crying. Why? The sheikh came to me and said, why are you crying? Tomorrow is Eid. I said, I don't want to leave. I want to stay in the masjid. You know, we have a beautiful house, a beautiful family. But I loved it more in the masjid. He said, well, if you really loved it, you need to go out and tell more and more people so that they can come and experience what you experienced. And that is the only thing that he was able to calm me down through and convince me that leaving the i'tikaf and going out so that I can take a ghusl and come uh, for the Eid prayer, dressing up uh, with the new clothes, and really celebrate Eid. And soon after Eid, we started coming back to the masjid. But now, as the Sheikh said, we started visiting people in their homes, in the coffee shops, in the streets, and convincing them to come to the masjid to try it, to taste it. And it did work out perfectly, mashallah. So what I'm trying to say is, in Arabic they say, a person who visualizes things so that it becomes tangible is completely different. And it is completely different than just hearing about it. You keep hearing about the i'tikaf, but you haven't tried it. You keep reading about the night prayer and tahajjud, but you did not really experience it. Uh, you keep hearing about how the worshippers enjoy their worship. So they enjoy waking up at night to pray. Well, you don't know why they enjoy it because you haven't tried it. Try it. And that is the idea of giving us nafahat. It's stated in the hadith nafahat. You know, like bonus. Okay, if you do this, we'll give you extra reward. So come and taste it. You come and try it and you like it. You get used to it. You come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The following hadith, hadith number 1193, teaches us that it isn't sufficient to take care of yourself and to be a devout worshiper and to stay up for the night prayer for the whole night in the last remaining time nights of Ramadan, uh, hoping that it will coincide with Laylatul Qadr. This is great, but that's not sufficient. Why? At home, you have some family members. Where are they? Why don't you bring them with you? Why don't you make sure that your siblings, your parents, your children, and everyone is involved in this goodness, not just yourself. We know from the beginning, when Allah the Almighty ordered Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to propagate this message of Islam, he said you should begin with whom? With Abu Jahl, with Abu Sufyan, with the Meccan chieftains? No. 
He said, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ The closest to you, your tribe, your family members. Begin with them. You know, why do we travel far away to give da'wah while we have not even attempted to give da'wah to our own household? The siblings, the children, the parents, the uncles, the cousins, the aunts. Make an effort with them. And also with regards to those who are living under your roof and you are the person who puts bread on the table. So it becomes your responsibility to look after them religiously. Educate them in respect of learning their deen. Make certain that they do what is good like you do and they stay away from what is forbidden because it's your responsibility. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in number 6 of Surah Al-Tahreem, O oh, who you believe, Ya ayuha ladina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum naram wa quduha nasu wal hijara. Yes, it is my duty to protect not just myself, but my wife, my children, the maid who's working for us, and everyone who's living under my roof. So Aisha radiyallahu anha, qalat, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل العشر الأواخر من رمضان أحيا الليل وأيقظ أهله وجد وشد المئزر This hadith is agreed upon its authenticity. I know some of you want me to say it again. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل العشر الأواخر من رمضان أحيا الليل وأيقظ أهله وجد وشد المئزر here is a mother of the believers, Aisha radiyallahu anha, tells us that whenever the last ten nights of Ramadan would begin, Rasulullah, peace be upon him, would keep awake at night, no more sleep. No more sleep. So keeping awake to do what? Watch TV? Social media? YouTube? No, 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 no. Wake up for the whole night, Prayer and devotion. Ah, so in other nights, he used to take a break or pray taraweeh and go to sleep or get up to pray before Fajr. But in the last ten nights, not a chance. It's Laylatul Qadr. So he would stay awake for the whole night, no sleep. It's only five nights. We spoke about it before the odd nights. Okay. Wajadda, washadda. But before that, أيقظ أهله And he would awaken his family as well. Even though Fatima was married, but he would go and knock on her door. علي Fatima, get up. Get up to pray. He would make certain that his family members are all awake for the prayer and devotion in order to witness the same goodness like him. Hopefully it would be Laylatul Qadr. So he'd awaken his family members and prepare himself to be more diligent in worship. Jadda wa shadda al mi'zar. Shadda mi'zarahu, the Arab sometimes used metaphor. Al mi'zar is the waste built. You see the laborers, the construction guys, they wear a belt in order to secure their waste because they lift heavy weight. And also the bodybuilders in the gym, they lift heavy weight. They don't want to rupture their muscles, so they were big built. al mizar is some sort of built of fabric that they used to <coughs> tie it around their waist as an announcement or in preparation for heavy labor. So Shadda Mi'zarahu would indicate that he was about to do a heavy labor, a hard work. He will stay up all night in the prayer. Also, Shadda Mi'zarahu refers to another metaphor, which is he would abstain from having sexual relations. We don't have time for that in the remaining 10 nights of Ramadan. And this is what is confirmed by the ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ So we learn from that. Family members should be included. MashaAllah, you're a Quranic teacher. You've taught and you've given ijazah to hundreds of foreigners 
and non-Arab and beginners. What about your own children? Not a single one of them knows how to read Quran. What a shame. You should be proud of first teaching your own children. Then I extend to the outside society, to others. So do not forget your children from the share of education, from the share of bringing them into the pen of the deen, into taking them with you to the masjid, Fajr prayer, Isha prayer, attend the ta'aleem, so that insha'Allah they will be secured because life is full of tests and trials, tribulations. And nowadays it is very dangerous. And when you sit with the youth and their mind is blanco, I mean they don't have any informations about the deen. I can assure you such youth are subject to lose their faith and even become agnostic or maybe atheist because anyone can fool them and can throw some misconceptions at them and they don't know how to handle it because you didn't really invest in them. He will stay up all night in prayer and devotion and he would wake or awaken his family so that they would join him in the worship. Let's take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a few minutes for some more beautiful hadith in this respect. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh brothers and sisters this is your brother Shams al-Duha join me in a series of episodes discussing examples of the concise and comprehensive speech of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam these are ahadith uh, that have been particularly mentioned by Imam Abu Dawud rahmatullahi alayhi as words of the Prophet that are short but that impact many many different aspects of our lives and give us a world view for how to live our lives Assalamu alaikum wa my name is John Fontaine and we'd just like to invite you for, for the brand new series to Huda TV and the series is called Judaism and Christianity in the Light of Islam. Throughout this series we're going to be discussing the Islamic perspective of revelation, the Islamic perspective of the people of the book, the people of the book from the time of the original prophets, also the people of the book at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the people of the book of today. We're going to be discussing the books that they have. We're also going to be discussing some of the interactions of the Prophet Wasallam that he had with some of the kings around Arabia and also some of the tribes within Arabia. We're also going to be mentioning some authentic stories, authentic hadith regarding people of the book from the past. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. In the following hadith, hadith number 1194, which is narrated by Aisha radiyallahu anha qalat, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يجتهد في رمضان ما لا يجتهد في غيره وفي العشر الأواخر منه ما لا يجتهد في غيره رواه مسلم So Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, narrated that the messenger of Allah 
sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem used to strive harder in worship during Ramadan than he strove in any other time of the year. And he would devote himself more in worship in the last ten nights of Ramadan than he strove in the earlier parts of Ramadan itself. And I guess put in this hadith as the last of the hadith that is talking about the verses of um, Laylatul Qadr is, is, is really smart because now you know why the Prophet ﷺ would pay more attention to Ramadan and its nights than the rest of the year. And then in Ramadan, the last ten nights than the rest of Ramadan itself. As for Ramadan, the hadith says, whoever qama Ramadan, iman and wahdisab, and all his previous sins will be forgiven. Okay, so this is not like any other month. Pray in night prayer with the imam or by yourself during Ramadan who will secure your forgiveness for all your previous sins. Then there is even more exclusive reward in one particular night, which is Laylatul Qadr, the grand night, which is one of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So he would make an effort in Ramadan more than any other time of the year. And then in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, he would devote himself in worship more than even the earlier parts of Ramadan. As she said in the previous hadith, Ahya Layla, for the whole night is awake, no more sleep. Rasulullah is setting the example is showing us how role model should be. Is showing us the path. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا This role model is our best example and role model, but for whom? For those who believe in Allah and in the last day and hope to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the last day with plenty of good deeds. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا so all those hadith which we have studied earlier, it's not Ramadan now. We're done with Ramadan. It was two months ago. But the companions of the Prophet wasallam, after finishing Ramadan, they would not forget about it. Because for approximately six months, they would be asking Allah, Oh Allah, accept our worship during Ramadan. It's past two, three, four, five, six months. And now, Whenever there is about six months or five months remaining for the upcoming Ramadan, they keep busy asking Allah, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, please give us a long life so that we can witness the upcoming Ramadan. It is not just make us live longer so that I can witness my son's graduation or I can get this job or I can travel here or there. All of that is good. But the ultimate goal is witness another Ramadan, yani witness another Laylatul Qadr. Hopefully, I will gain its virtues. I would achieve its excellence. Then I would be promoted and I will get closer to you and I will be in a higher rank. This is the concern of a true believer. Then, finally, the last hadith in the chapter, chapter number 214, the excellence of praying at night during Laylatul Qadr, the last hadith, hadith number 1195. It is concerning what kind of supplication is best to be recited during this night. An Aisha radiallahu anha qalat, Qultu ya Rasulallah, araayta in alimtu ayyu laylatin laylatul qadri ma aqulu fiha. Qala quli, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa our mother asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Prophet of Allah, if I realize which night is the night of Al-Qadr, the grand night, what should I supplicate in it? What dua should I recite best in it? So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, you should supplicate Allahumma, O oh Allah, innaka, indeed you are, afuwun, 
Afoon from Afu. Af means pardoning. Afoon of pardoning. Ever pardoning. That is the meaning of Afu, one of his names. To hibbul Afwa. Yani, you love to pardon. Fafu anni, so I beg your pardon. Forgive me my sins and pardon me. That's it. This is a dua. Well, yeah. Because it's a very comprehensive dua. It simply reflects the fact that no one will enter paradise without receiving salvation. This is what the Quran says. It says in Surah Ali Imran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ Then, وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ it says in Surah Al-Hadid, سَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ So in order to get there, you first have to receive the certificate of forgiveness, certificate of pardon. No matter what kind of good deeds, how much good deeds we do, it is never sufficient. Not because you did not commit sins. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was infallible. But he was trying to do his best to catch up with the ibadah more and more and more. Because the ibadah is a duty that we owe to Allah to show gratitude. To be grateful for some of his countless blessings upon us. And no matter what we do, it is never sufficient. So then we resort to begging Allah for forgiveness for our sins and for our shortcomings that we did not do enough in order to be grateful and show gratitude to the Almighty Allah. And also there is an extra meaning that is delivered in the concept of Af greater than just Maghfirah. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says عَفُوٌ غَفُور If both of them, Al-Afu and Al-Ghafur, had the same exact meaning, then it will be useless to mention two synonyms, two words, which are exactly the same. One of them must provide deeper meaning, greater meaning, or more meaning than the others. There could be some sort of overlapping. They have shared meanings. But in Al-Afu, there is a greater meaning than mere maghfira. So we resort to the Arabic scholars of grammar, of linguistics, in order to fetch out in the dictionary what is so special about Al-Afu that makes it maybe greater than maghfira. They said, the Arab have always said the bad ones. When they say, Afat al rih the wind blew and it covered the footsteps. So we cannot recognize who is here. We cannot trace the footsteps of people who were in this area earlier. Because the sand was blown and it covered the whole area. Okay. al maghfira is forgiveness. Maghfira is forgiveness. And al maghfira linguistically is to wear something to cover up. So al maghfira forgiveness through covering up your sins. Covering up your sins, but in the, uh, in the hard drive, in the original disk, they're there. They're easy to detect. Allah can fetch them out. His angels can see them. In the case of al-af, even the hard drive is erased. Afat al-rih is a tamasat al-athar. There are no traces, footprints. The sins which you've committed in the past are gone. Furthermore, they can even be turned into good deeds. If the person have repented sincerely, as it is stated in Surah Al-Furqan. So we see, when you say, Allahumma innaka afoon tuhibbu al-afwa, there is another narration that says, Kareem as well. A combination of two beautiful uh, names of the most beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Afu and Kareem. Afu, pardoning. Kareem, generous. Yeah, and he is the oath pardoning and he is the most generous, no doubt. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Surah Al-A'raf, whenever you come to invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, invoke Him through the best of means of approach, His names and attributes. He loves that. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا To Allah belong the beautiful names. And invoke Allah through His beautiful names, which we know. Because what we know about Allah's names, whether they are 99 or more, they are not all Allah's beautiful names. There are some, some, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shared with us, delivered to us in the book, in the Quran, in a previous revelation, or taught it to any of his, uh, you know, devout worshippers or any prophets. We say that in the dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak. Oh Allah, I ask you by every name of yours. سميت به نفسك that you named yourself with أو أنزلته في كتابك or you revealed it in your book أو علمته أحدا من خلقك or you taught it to any of your creatures أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك or a name that you kept with you in the knowledge of the unseen so that no one knows about it so what we know about Allah's names is very little those 99 names are those names which Allah allowed us to know or taught us in the revelation, in the book, through the messengers. But in reality, his names are beyond count. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى They are all most beautiful. فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا My biggest concern in Ramadan, we said in the previous hadith, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ مَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ It's like the whole idea revolves around forgiveness and pardoning. صح? Absolutely true. If this is the case, I'm even seeking something greater than forgiveness. Than just mere concealing and covering up my sins. I want my sins to be blown away. I don't want anyone to get to see my sins anymore. Not even the angels who recorded them and writing against me. So in this case, the best supplication is to say, Oh Allah, indeed you are Al-Afu, the pardoning, the oft pardoning, the best one to pardon, Ta'fu. And furthermore, you pardon because you love to pardon. You know? To hibbul af. فَعْفُ عَنِّي So I beg your pardon. This is the meaning of وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا If your dua is accepted on that night, then indeed you will be the truly successful person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all success. By that, brothers and sisters, we've finished chapter number 214. تَابُ فَضْلِ قِيَامِ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ And inshallah, in the next episode, we'll begin with a new chapter, with new verses of brushing your teeth. With the miswak and so on. Until next episode, I leave you all in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. He born in humans to be the best And give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to him He born in humans to be the best And give his best religion to them So why did they know that Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price. So Allah, Habib Allah.